Uh, I'm certified through Crown. Uh, well, it used to be Christian Financial Concepts. They changed. I was certified through Christian Financial Concepts, and then when they became Crown Ministries, my husband and I became Money Map coaches. And so now I noticed when I went on their website today that they had a lot of new things, a new program for finances, and you might want to look at that. Uh, they're usually really good and really well thought out the way that they do their programs. So, uh, so we're going to get started with, with our finances. Um, just We're going to have some class participation. <laughs> and here's the kind of things I want you to kind of go through in your mind um, and ask yourself, like, were your parents good with money? Did you have someone in your life that showed you, like, this is, this is how you want it to be when you're older? Did they lay it out for you? Like, this is how you get there. Or were they a good example of hand, handling money in a biblical way? Like, did they tithe? Or were they uh, generous? Or did they bring someone into their home who didn't have a home otherwise? Did they do things like that? And then the other thing is, like, if, if there was money borrowed in the family, are people going to borrow it from you, or are you going to borrow it from them? Um, the, the, the risky things that I see, the most risky thing I would worry about, and the, and the reason I would want you to pay very close attention if this is you, is if you've declared a bankruptcy and continued to borrow money. And the reason I, I bring that up is because uh, there's no shortage of people to loan you money, even if you've declared a bankruptcy. But if you've declared a bankruptcy and you're continuing to borrow money, um, I think you can have some help tonight. I think this will help. So we'll go ahead and get started. We're going to look at first what an ideal budget is. An ideal budget would be like the best budget ever. I don't know that anybody's got this. Um, and this is going to be the blanks on your, on your papers. So your ideal budget, this is going to, and we're going to contrast this with different kinds of budgets. The ideal budget, you're going to have three to six months in savings. Uh, you routinely follow a balanced budget, and by that I mean you plan. You plan on spending. Budget seems to be an ugly word to people. Spending plans seems a lot more fun. You can call it whatever you want to, whatever helps you. <laughs> But it's the kind of people that would follow a balanced budget. Like they plan on spending, they know that they're going to want to go to Europe in three years and they start saving then to go to Europe in three years. I have a friend that did that. You're accumulating savings. Every month there's a little bit left over, even after all your tithing, after all your expenses, there's enough left over to accumulate savings. If you missed a paycheck, it's not really a problem because you've got that three to six months of savings. You've got a little bit of a leeway if you lost your job to find another job. And you're tithing at least 10% or often more like you're generous. You're able to tithe and give offering above that. Now, a borderline budget, that's the kind of uh, time when I really like for people to come and get personal counseling. Because in a borderline budget, things are tight. They're not in a crisis yet. And usually with just a few tips, and you guys are going to get those tonight, and I, almost, I can almost promise you, you have someone in your family that you're going to be sharing this in within a week because people need access to this information and, when we, and it's not something that's taught in most schools. My son is taking a crown class at his school right now. Um, the borderline budget, if you contrast that to the ideal, it's breaking even, uh, living paycheck to paycheck, there's no savings happening but there's not a lot of debt being accumulated also. Uh, if you missed a paycheck, you'd have to extend credit until you got back on your feet. Maybe you could catch up that credit, maybe not. And you're tithing less than 10%. You're still tithing uh, maybe every other time or you're tithing at a reduced rate. Okay, has everybody got that? It, okay. <laughs> I should have warned you. I go fast. <laughs> so t tell me when you're ready. And stop me if you're not. Ready? Oh. <laughs> okay. Now, the next one that we're going to look at is a crisis budget. A crisis budget is when uh, I had someone describe it to me one time as the house is on fire. Crisis budget is when you're considering a bankruptcy because things are so bad. Creditors are calling. Um, 
you're waking up in the middle of the night worried about it, you're choosing which utility to have cut off. And the reason that I know these things is because I've been there and I'm not there now. So I know what it's like to have choose. There was one time when my husband and I had little kids and we'd moved into this house, great old house, loved it, first house we ever owned. Got our first heating bill in the winter, it's $300. We didn't have to, might as well have been $3,000. So I call up the heating company, I go, what do you guys do if somebody can't pay all this bill? They go, we, we cut your gas off. And we had little kids at home. Well, that decides which bill's being paid. <laughs> you know, it's just that type of thing. So that's a crisis budget. Um, you're not making ends meet. Debt's being accumulated every month. Um, there's, there's really no budget because what's the point of a budget when you're in a crisis situation? What are you budgeting? Like you're just trying to get through to the next day. Uh, you're extending credit every month. Uh, a missed paycheck would be a financial disaster. And you're not tithing. You, you don't see a way possible to tithe. Okay, now let me get caught up here. So what you need is a fresh start. And here's the kind of things like if I had newlywed couples in here, this is the kind of thing that I, I like to get them with is uh, like what is God calling you to do? Is he calling you to serve on a mission field? Is he calling you to go into ministry somewhere? Is he calling you to be an engineer and you haven't gone to school to be an engineer? What is God calling you to do? What's your heart's desire? Or as one of my son's coaches used to say, what makes your heart sing? And are you doing those things? Are you in, do you feel like you're in God's pleasure? Um, it's kind of like swimming with a tide. It's, it's wonderful. Are you there? And, and can you get there? And can you get there financially? And are there things you can do to get there? Because every decision that you make, every single one, should be made with God's plan for your family in mind. Um, we had a young couple here at our church. First of all, they were adorable. Everybody loved them. They were so sweet. And she worked while he went to college a semester. He worked while she went to college a semester. And they did that so they would not have debt so that when they graduated from college, they could go into the mission field. And that was the only way they could do it. So it took them eight years instead of four. And they did it. They achieved their goal. I wondered about them through the years, how, how things went with them. Um, and you know, like, I'm older now, and so I can, I've seen around the, I can see around the corners. I can see when somebody tells me something's going on in their life, Financially, I can kind of see, oh, you know, this is going to lead to this, and it looks like it's going to lead to that. We just call that seeing around corners. And when, you're, uh, when you can see around corners, <laughs> uh, you owe it to people to kind of help them, you know. And so um, not that anyone is going to take your advice, but should they ask you and you feel like getting stomped a little bit, just go ahead and give them your advice because, you know, they have to answer to God and you have to answer for God, to God for what you do, and they answer for what they do. And, and these are the kind of things that I wish I had known. I never dreamed I'd stay at home with my baby. Never dreamed it. I found out I was pregnant, I started looking at daycares. And uh, our first child was born with multiple disabilities. I still made it work. Found a daycare to take care of him. Uh, it did not work. I, I worked six weeks. I went from full-time to part-time within two weeks, quit working at the end of, of four weeks and stayed home for uh, 20 years. Um, and then the other thing I'd like them to do is just live below their income level. There was a book that came out and it talked about live in the best house that you can afford and it was talking about things like that, but I think if you're a young couple, it'd be a real good idea to live below your income level, save some money while you've got it. Like, this is a great time and that money invested into things like IRAs and it's going to grow so much if you've got it. Um, 
employer matching funds for retirement. If you guys in here, I know that, you know, that you're not newlyweds, but you want to participate fully in that. That's something you want to sacrifice to do. If it means a lesser cell phone, a lesser cable, <laughs> whatever, that, that comes back to say hello to you when you hit 50. And uh, you'll be glad you did that. And uh, then I've always liked to share this with them because they all want to be millionaires. <laughs> so I give them how to be a millionaire if you're 30 or if you're 20. Okay. Okay, so when you're doing a budget, and I'm going to give you some forms to let you do a budget on paper. I'm going to give you some resources to do one online. In fact, a couple of those. And uh, I'm not going to give those out until the end because I found that when I hand them out early, everybody goes straight to the handouts because <laughs> that's why you're here. You're here because you want to do things better financially. You go straight to the hand hand handouts, you leave me. So I don't want to lose you. Um, so when you're, when you're figuring these out and you're figuring out income, don't forget things that come in once a year. Like you know your salary, but like if you're getting a 2000, a tw let's say this, $2,400 tax refund, and you're incurring debt of about $200 every month, and then you're going on a vacation because you got $2,400, it might be better to take that $2,400 and put it in savings to cover that $200 deficit that you have through the year. So don't forget things that come in infrequently. When you're determining expenses, most married couples have a saver and a spender. Let's hear it for the savers. Savers? Savers? Okay. All right. And how about the senders? Spenders. How about the spenders? Where are we? And so, uh, and so most of the time you're going to have savers and spenders. Works out great when you listen to each other and when you cooperate when you're budgeting and when you're honest with each other. And determining your debt load. So now we're going to go off the chart just a moment. Um, I've been credit counseling a long time. The first time this happened, it was very surprising to me. I had a man come in. Uh, this was 20 years ago. He had over $100,000 worth of income. Uh, I would have pictured if I had that much income that I'd be riding a yacht and, and, and driving a Lamborghini. Like, <sighs> this guy had this income, and I thought, what problem could he possibly have? So he comes in and he brings a grocery bag and he sets the grocery bag down. Now look in the grocery bag, it's bills. A grocery bag. I'm not talking about a bottle, of, I mean like a paper grocery bag. And I said, what, what you got in the grocery bag? And he goes, well, that's my bills. And I said, oh, uh, are these the bills that you've paid? Like, is this for your accountant? And, no, no, these are the bills I can't pay. Okay, we start going through these bills we spent two hours figuring out how much money he owed. What you do in that situation is you take the bag of bills, you put them on a chair, you sort them by category, like electric bill, power bill, credit card bill, and then you put the most recent one on top. If that's you, if you've got a sack full of, of bills that's hard to face, and you can't do that by yourself, if you don't have someone that loves you enough to go through that with you, and you might not, or you don't want to do that with someone, call me. I'll do that with you. We'll help. I'll, we'll figure that out together. Um, it it has happened more than once. Sometimes the bags have been smaller, but a lot of times people, to avoid dealing with it, they'll just put the bills in a bag and like uh, I I can't pay them, so I'm not going to look at them. And so determining your debt load can be a real emotional thing. The other thing that I saw uh, was a lot of times, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later as well, you'll have a couple and I don't really know how to ex explain it, but this is the person that makes sure they get the mail every day. And they make sure that there's no creditors calling the home. And they're doing that not out of secrecy as much, 
but they're doing that to avoid conflict because they don't want, really it's out of love. They don't want the, the other spouse to know how bad things are. And so out of love, they're trying to protect them. And sometimes when you're determining this debt load, the most courageous thing is being honest about how bad things are. And uh, after you've done all those things and you've figured out all your expenses, you determine your net spendable income. Now, <clears throat> this is going to go fast. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm just going to go ahead and put all these up here and talk about them all at one time. I should have done just this whole slide. Um, okay. So when you figure out what your expenses are, what your income is, what money's left over, if that money, if that's a positive number, like you have money left over after expenses are met, these are some things that you can do to to help make a plan, a spending plan. If it's a negative number, these are some things that you can do to help get it from a negative number to a positive number. And we're going to talk about some things that you can do for that. Okay, <clears throat> so why do we overspend? Like, a lot of times, <laughs> Okay, so I had a couple coming, uh, coming to credit counseling, and I said, so uh, how much money is in your checking account right now? They said, well, our checking account's overdrawn. I said, well, how much is in your savings? We don't have any savings. So did you eat dinner out tonight? Yeah, we ate dinner out tonight. <laughs> How'd you pay for it? Credit card. And, and we all just started laughing because they were being honest about how, what had happened and so that's the honesty about what's going on in your financial situation that's what you want to uh, to go to so so why do we overspend well the love illusion you're trying to protect the other person you're avoiding conflict uh, most people call that codependence <laughs> we sacrifice our financial health to avoid conflict with someone we love and here's why that's wrong. Matthew 6, 21 says, Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And Matthew 6, 33 says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. And so it talks about trying to please God rather than man. Um, I figured out, I went to a, a seminar, and I figured out during that seminar that I was trying to please people a lot more than I was trying to please God. And if I tried to please God in the process, most of those people would be pleased. And the ones that wouldn't be pleased, they would not be pleased with my actions either. They're just not going to be pleasable. So, so a love illusion. The second thing is we undervalue what we have. This leads to a lot of marriage problems as well, is the grass is always greener type of thing. And if you undervalue what you have, it's a discontent. And discontent is a sin. And we can study about that sin in Philippians 4, 10 through 13. It's where Paul talks about being content no matter what. Um, the next thing is sometimes we're self-centered. I had a friend say this to me. She was talking about her financial situation, which was in a kind of a rough spot. She said, you know, I realized I don't deny myself anything. I tell myself I deserve it. I deserve this. I buy it. And that's, she said, and, and I realized that's so self-centered because I'm choosing my pleasure over someone else's pleasure. And so the self-centered would be uh, putting the needs of others above our calling to live a life pleasing to God. Uh, the scripture to back that up is Philippians 2, 4. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. And, and a budget that honors God is, is good for your family. And then time. This is the thing that I see a lot of younger couples, but I mean, 
pretty much if there's a sin up there, I can tell you that I've committed that sin. Even these things that are going through, I've, I've gone through counseling with people. I've also, I've also dealt with these myself. And time is the one that was toughest for me because a lot of times when I felt like we needed something, I felt like we needed it right now. Like right now. And I didn't wait on God to provide it. I thought, I'll provide it. Or my husband can provide it. Or we're going to make this happen. <laughs> and, and, and what I should have done was give God an opportunity to provide that thing. I um, had a family in counseling that uh, wanted, needed a new van. And uh, I'd ask them to pray for a month about it and ask if they had praying people in their lives to ask them to join them in prayer. At the end of that month, they came back to see me and I said, well, how'd it go? They said, well, we got two vans. And she said, and my little girl prayed for a blue van. And they're both blue. So we just need to give God time. And, and if we don't do that time, it sounds a little bit like greed. <laughs> and uh, there's lots of scripture about greed, but Luke 12, 15 and Matthew 6, 8 are two of the scriptures that, that talk about greed. Okay. How are we doing? All right. Oh, this is awesome. Okay, great. All right, uh, to get a budget that works. Go. <laughs> Go. Okay, uh, tools. Okay, crown.org, that's, that's the organization I was telling you about. The reason I've got this under tools, crown.org website is super Cool. One of the things it has is like uh, money life calculators. I don't know if you've ever been to it, but it has, uh, you go to crown.org and then you click on uh, personal finance or tools. And then under that it's, it has downloads and the downloads are going to be the financial forms you can fill out like pencil and paper. And some of us prefer pencil and paper, like me. My husband prefers spreadsheets. So that's, that's doable. He can print off a spreadsheet. We're, we're both good that way. But I just need to see it in black and white right in front of me. I don't want to go to a computer to see how much money I should spend at the grocery store. So um, Crown.org has, uh, has the forms that I'm going to be handing out to you in just a minute. But it also has uh, these calculators. <laughs> and with the calculators, uh, it's got like should renting versus buying things and like a 50-year loan versus a 30-year a loan. You put in there how much you want to borrow for your house and it shows you how much you're going to spend over the length of the loan if you choose a 15-year over a 30-year. And then like if you pay extra, what would happen? That's cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is a great one. The college funding calculator. That's great too. Especially if you got a smart kid, because you know, you got a smart kid, you know they're going to college. And uh, just sooner than later on that one. But just go ahead and go there, and then, you know, it, if it's just too much, just call me. We, we can look at your budget and figure out some things we can do. Um, there's a book called Spending Plan Solutions. Let me see here. Yeah, spending plan solutions. You can buy it on Amazon. You can buy it used. It says that there's one used for one cent. It's done in 2008. It's a really great book to have on your bookshelf. It's just something nice to have. It's, uh, it kind of goes through all the kind of things that we've talked about, and it gives you some tools that you can use, and it's just a nice resource. Oh, the life insurance need calculator. That's something that's a little bit of an eye-opener also. So that's for people that, that want to have it in black and white or you want to use the calculators. Now, that's not everybody. Oh, that's how to get to some of the forms that I'm going to hand out tonight. Monthly income and expenses. That's the form you're going to get in just a minute. Uh, Mint.com is a website that 
puts everything in an app in your hand on your cell phone. Tracks your spending. Uh, I noticed on the Crown website they also have a, a system of doing that now that's an app that will track your spending. It's kind of nice to have. You know, that's something that's neat. Um, I checked it out. I really liked it too, the mint.com. I haven't checked out the one on Crown. Uh, so then we're going to have handouts. We're already doing handouts, Miss Sue. All right. Okay. Um, the first thing I'm going to hand out is is percentages for a family of four. This is one of the things. It's on the Crown website. It it talks about uh, what what ideally you should have. What's neat about that is if, if, if you apply that to your budget, you'll find if, if your budget is just really not working out and you can't figure out what it is, when you apply these percentages, these ideal percentages, something's going to jump out at you as, oh my goodness, I had no idea that that was the problem. If that problem is, for example, that your housing is 60% of your income, and you realize, oh man, I didn't realize that that's what I'm spending to live in this house. And we can live in this house or we can have a life. You might want to sell your house. Never counseled someone that sold their house, but I've recommended it sometimes. Um, the next form, next two forms are the monthly income expenses, which is referenced here, and then the list of debts. It's just a way to put it down on paper. Um, you can go to the website and print off more if you have more debts than are listed on. If, if you have more debts and there are blanks on that paper. Thank you, Ms. Sue. I appreciate that. Um, so when you have your prayer time tonight, and I want to talk just a second about praying together because my husband is not, uh, he's not really like comfortable with praying out loud with just me. <laughs> it's not something either one of us kind of, like it's just a little weird to us. And I know it shouldn't be because that should be the person you pray with the most. And there's certainly times that we do. But at night, if you want to pray together and you don't really feel like just laying it all out there <laughs> verbally, um, just grab each other's hand, pray, pray silently, and then let go when you're done. Um, it's a way to pray together without making anybody feel awkward or uncomfortable. And we've tried that and it worked. Um, when you have your prayer time, be honest with God about, about your finances. Um, it, you've probably been at Stuart Heights long enough, because I recognize all you guys. You've probably been here long enough to hear Gary go through the, uh, the way to fight. Like, be honest, keep current, act, don't react, attack the problem, not the person. It's, a, it's really good information, but the first thing is be honest. And so, be honest with God about where you are with your finances. A, a turning point for me in my life was when I admitted to God how bad I had messed up everything when I was trying to be in charge. And that I didn't, that I had, I gave up. It's like, here, here it is. You can have everything. You can have title to everything. And, and for me, I was giving God title to most things, but I had some things that I wasn't going to give him because, well, I told you our, our oldest child has special needs, and I was afraid to give him uh, my ownership, <laughs> as if he doesn't already have it already, but like, I didn't want to give my family. I wanted to keep everything but my family. Just keep your hands off my family. And when I finally gave God my family, that's when I began to grow as a Christian. That was, that was the part for me that, I, that I, it had to happen. Um, When, when you are in a crisis situation and you've got uh, fires burning <laughs> here and there and you're so busy putting out fires 
that you don't really take a deep breath and just kind of look at everything as a whole. Take a minute and just thank God for everything you can think of. Every single thing you can think of. Thank you, God, that I have shoes on my feet, that our car started today, um, that my boss didn't yell at me. Thank God for every single thing. Don't go to the negative side. Go to the positive side. Thank God for everything. And your outlook will change. So, now we go to how we change. Well, now here's the meat and potatoes of everything we've done so far. Well, the first thing we do is we tithe. That's how you change. Let's say you've got a, a crisis budget. There's just not a lot, like you don't tithe because you don't really see a way to tithe. Start by tithing 1%. Like when you get your paycheck, you look at the gross income and you take 1% of that and you dedicate that as God's part of your budget with the understanding that as things change, that percent will get bigger. Begin, just, just give it a try. It's the only place in the Bible God says, to test him. He, he, he tells us we can test him on this. Um, when I was a credit counselor in a in non-biblical world, uh, we always said there's only three things you can do. You can increase your income, decrease your living expenses, or alter your debt load. That's the only thing you can do to your budget. Tithing is a significant way to alter your budget. But uh, increasing your income, decreasing your living expenses, altering your debt load. Uh, all those things are going to help too. And the kind of thing, uh, like when you come to increase in income, ask yourself, are there, uh, can I work a part-time job with the sole purpose of retiring debt? And when the debt is retired, I quit the job. Um, is there a skill that I have that I could tutor or could I teach piano? Or is there something I have that would make me unique uh, to offer a service that could bring a little bit of extra money in? Even if it's just $25 a week, that's probably gas money for a car that you don't have to spend out of your pocket. Um, decreasing living expenses. Okay, let's talk about bundling. Do you guys, do you guys bundle like your your internet and your cell phones and your, and your cable and things like that. If you don't, take a look at that. We saved $100 in one day, $100 a month in one day by taking the services we had with three different people and putting them in one. And we increased our internet speed, which was very important at our house. It meant nothing to me. But to my kids, this was a great day because now we've got super fast internet. And, um, Altering your debt load. Uh, the Consumer Credit Counseling Service is here in town. The Consumer Credit Counseling Service has a program called a debt management plan. I noticed on the Cred Crown website, they also have a debt management plan where uh, they send out checks to your creditors and in return for being in the program, your creditors agree to freeze interest while you're repaying the debt. Some creditors agree, some creditors don't. The ones that don't, as you pay off the lesser owed creditors, you put that money on those. And you, you, you know, the snowball effect where you put the, if you pay off one, you don't decrease the amount you put towards debt. You put that $5 towards another one, and then you put that 15 towards the next one. And your debt begins to snowball into going away. And the debt management plan is a good thing if your credit score is, has taken a hit or two anyway, it's, it's a good thing to do. Um, and then finally, this is the thing that drives me crazy. Have the person that's best with money handle the money. If you're the spender in your family, you're probably not the best person to handle the money. The saver, they're probably going to do a better job because they are future focused. You're current focused. You're both important in the marriage. But when it comes to finances and planning for the future, odds are the, the saver's probably gonna be better with money and is probably gonna get you in a better place financially. And 
we come to the end of our class. Let me give you an example of what you get to look forward to next week. You can be thinking about this family. This is a family. They're coming in to see you. You're their credit counselor. And this is all that you know about them. You can't have anything else. This is it. Family of four. You're going to get their income. You're going to get their kids. You're going to see how they are financially. And you have to help them to figure out what's wrong and how they can fix it. Super fun. So I think you look, I, that was my favorite part. And we, we actually divided up into teams the last time we did this and it got a little competitive. <laughs> and so uh, there may or may not be prizes involved. We don't know. We'll just have to see. Might be something pretty cool for the winning team. So uh, that's it for, for the class. And we're done, you know, a little early. Uh, One of the people that you're going to talk about next week in your people that you're going to credit counsel is uh, an older woman in your church who hasn't come to you, but you know from her children that these things are happening, which is she's having to decide every month which medication to buy because she doesn't have enough money to buy all her medicine. So she's trying to decide should she choose this medication because that problem's the worst right now and a lot of people do that right because a lot of times you're in that situation and so um when 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 you're having your prayer time just think about the older people in our church that were counting on social security to be the thing that got them through and now they're there and and they're 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 really struggling and so please say a prayer for them and <clears throat> The, the very last thing that I want to talk to you about, um, if you have aging parents, and if you do have aging parents, that means you've got parents, and that's a blessing. Um, as your parents age, there are a host of legal issues with finances when you are dealing with older people. Um, If your parents are aging, get to an attorney. Have the attorney talk to you and to them about what kind of things need to happen. You can find an attorney for $125 an hour. You can get a will done for about three to $500, a simple will. If you don't have a will, you need a will. That's a way to get one done. Uh, that way you've kind of crossed, till I, had to, till I had to see an attorney, we'd never seen an attorney and it would have saved us a lot of money to have seen the attorney first rather than later in dealing with issues with aging parents. Um, and so I just want to leave you with one thought about that. Uh, there's something in Medicare called the five-year look back. Has anybody ever heard of that? You know what I'm talking about? Okay. Five-year look back means that what they do is if you have a family member that goes into a nursing home, they look back five years from that day and they ask you did any assets transfer hands in this last five years that means did they give you a truck <laughs> did they uh, is there any money that they gave you you know that type of thing uh, did that did that thing benefit them and here's what this is not legal advice I am not even this is not legal advice. This is something the attorney told me. <laughs> and I'm telling you, there's a lady. She had $100,000. Uh, three years ago, she gave her church $50,000. She put $50,000 into savings. Three years later, she goes into a nursing home. What that means for her is that before Medicare will pay $1 for her nursing home, $100,000 has to be exhausted. That means that somebody's got to pay that. So the $50,000 is easy. You know, it's right there. The $50,000 that she might have donated to her church, that has to be exhausted before, before uh, Medicare will begin to pay for the nursing home. Um, that's one of the things that you learn when you have aging parents and you sit down with an attorney. Not a great day. No, not a great day. 
So God bless you guys. If you have a family member who's borrowing money from you, especially, make them come to see me before they borrow any more money. If you really want to loan them the money, tell them there's one condition. You have to go to credit counseling. And then loan them the money if you want to. But hopefully you won't have to.